Hello, my name is Clive Chang, and I am honored to serve as president of Young Arts. I'm joining you today from the Young Arts campus in Miami, Florida, which is situated on the traditional homeland of Native nations, including the Tequesta, the Calusa, the Taino, and today the Miccosukee and the Seminole. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future, and recognize their continued existence and contributions to our community. Thank you all, artists, friends, and family, for joining us. And welcome to the official launch of the 2023 Anthology and Catalog of Works by Young Arts winners in Design Arts, Photography, Visual Arts, and Writing. These editions are released annually by Young Arts and are often the first opportunity for young artists to see their works published, representing a bold step toward a professional future in the arts. At Young Arts, our mission is to identify exceptional young artists, amplify their potential, and invest in their lifelong creative freedom. Each of the artists represented in this collection has become a part of the Young Arts community for life. Whether it's professional development, creative opportunities, funding, or other forms of support, wherever your artistic career takes you, Young Arts is there. Today, you will hear from a number of artists each will briefly share with us their exceptional work and a little bit about the inspiration behind the pieces. I know you will be every bit as inspired and moved as I have been after having this unique opportunity to see and hear about their works. Before we kick off our program, I'd like to share with you a brief video featuring testimonials from past Young Arts winners that encapsulates what it means to be a part of the Young Arts community for life. Thank you again for joining us, and please enjoy the program. Artists. Create. Innovate. Inspire. Being an artist is challenging. I always tell people that it's a miracle if you're an artist in any capacity because it's so hard. <laughs> the Young Arts Award was a massive yes in a sea of no and maybe and I'm not so sure. Even though I didn't go to nationals, to still be honorable mention and still be a part of a humongous community of other artists, no matter what your ranking is, to still let you know you did it. This is still an accomplishment. How they boost you during that week um, is just one step, it's one boost. Young Arts has never left, and I have gotten to collaborate with so many young artists across the span of more than five years on film projects, interdisciplinary projects, residencies. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs as an artist, and there's so many moments where you doubt, you know, should I keep going? And to have an organization like Young Arts with you every step of the way. They definitely have not let me go <laughs> at all. <laughs> they do support you with the funding and the platform or what you would need to get that boost. I got one of the emergency grants when I was trying to figure out how to keep my house and keep my piano. It's nice to know that somebody's looking for that for all of us. They also helped support this project Alone Together, which funded 20 younger artists for commissions. And we had a total of 40 premieres, and then the disc actually got a Grammy, which was crazy. I had never been asked or given support, really, to produce a work. I'm literally here right now in this residency because Young Arts connected me to CAP UCLA. And because of that, my Arts Collective Tribe we have six co-commissioning presenters for this new work that we're creating called Touch of Red. One of the most incredible things that Young Arts did for me in the past few years is they actually gave me a grant to make a music video for my song Through the Fire featuring Chance the Rapper. I'm about to put out another record and they gave me a micro grant to finish that one. And I know it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but when you have your back against the wall, that little bit of help is everything. Being an artist is challenging. But 
artists are worth it. And young arts, For life. Young arts 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 for life. My name is Marcus Bui and I'm the 2023 Photography winner. The title of my work is named Quiet Arise, which is part of a larger collection of work that takes us to the scene that best showcases my identity. A location in which I experience spouts of despair, anxiety, joy, and happiness, and the place in which the passage of time has taken hold most, home. In the scenes of utmost tranquility and quiet, there have always been underlying tensions, and these problems are rooted in the shadows, whether it be the struggle of identity, the privilege of rest, or the expectation the child must live up to according to the parent. Though, it should be said that shadows cannot exist without the light. In my work, I make the most out of the use of attentional light in both the settings of night and day, and overall, this body of work is an outlet to express who I am. In the same way a writer writes a memoir, my photographs capture who I once was. Hi, I'm Annie Johnson. I'm a 2023 winner in writing and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my story, Her Body as Exotic Fruit. I'm 16 and remember the advice I have been given. Re Jenny Shaw, re-writing, re-writing about being Asian. I wrote a story about my own money and the suffering she endured to come to America and make a life here, about her secret yearning to return to her people with their exotic paper lanterns and their true silk rituals and their beautiful foreign culture. For several sentences, I liken her body to a piece of exotic fruit. Her hanbok like the silky wings of the wise cranes that shriek across the watercolor skies and also our ancestors' spirits. Her eyes, all brown and misty like the fog over the Korean mountains, not any mountains in particular, just Korean ones. After getting my acceptance letter in the mail, I text Jenny Shaw again. It's been a year, but still, she tries to act excited. Oh my god, congrats, it was so fun, you're going to love it. Ah ha ha, I hope so. Thanks for the tips, by the way, I did what you said. Oh my god, glad I could help. Yeah, LMAO, the funny thing is, though, I don't know if my writing genuinely got better or if it's just what I chose to write about, lol. What do you mean? Like, I don't know, I just keep thinking. If I wrote about anything else, would I still have gotten in? Oh, lol, yeah, probably not. Why? What do you mean? Why do you think that is? Why do they want you to write about being Asian? Oh, I don't know, lol, they probably just want to know about your identity and stuff. They like it when you write about other things too, like about being gay or about being a woman, stuff like that. Yeah, but like, isn't there more to me than that? Why does my voice only matter when it's about all the ways that I'm oppressed? There's a pause. When I see that Jenny isn't typing, I add lol. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is David Chen and I was a 2022 Merit winner in writing creative nonfiction and a 2023 honorable mention winner in writing creative nonfiction. Today, I'll be reading a little bit from my piece, Self. Red, self, life, family, ritual, memory, tradition, culture. I begin life with myself in a restaurant. I've struggled for a long time on what to call it. I used to call it Chinese, but it's not quite Chinese. It's not like the Pidan Shorojo my father makes on Sunday mornings or one day off from the restaurant. But it's not quite American either, at least not enough for Carrie with a K, a former cashier. She always ran next door to G.B. Snyder's local bar and grill for a half pound hamburger and crinkle cut fries after her shift, despite my mother always offering to cook her dinner. Recently, I've conceded to calling it Chinese takeout. I decided it's not worth stressing over. Chinese takeout gets the point across, and people know what I'm talking about. General Tso's chicken, cream cheese wontons, and the like. 
I filled almost every role in this restaurant. The son of Lao Ban and Lao Ban Yang, Yu Guo, Da Bao, and as of getting my driver's license about eight months ago, Wai Mai. The little boy who had to climb onto the counter in order to take customers' orders and could barely string together a sentence of understandable English turned into a teenager who ran the Qian Tai all by himself. The only role I haven't filled yet is Chu Shi, and that's only because I'm afraid I'd burn the restaurant down if it got too busy. I have to admit, I'm pretty clumsy. Despite my clumsiness, however, I've actually never had a serious injury. It was mainly just minor burns here and there from rogue drops of flying oil. I've always had the liberty of going slow and being careful. I've always had time. Hi, I'm Paul Fowler. I'm a 2023 Young Arts Honorable Mention winner in photography. I'm 18 years old and I'm from Massachusetts. My piece titled Let Outside has been chosen for this year's anthology and I'd like to tell you more about it. This image is from a series titled The Cult of Queer Domesticity, which explores the relationship between gender and domestic space. The series follows me as I travel throughout my home and end up outside where I'm confronted with the invisible walls of domesticated gender. At this point in the narrative, I've finally been let outside where I am in a masculine suit and presented with a mirror to look at myself. I wanted to create a surreal environment to really capture the psychological aspect of this moment, so I set the image in the snow, which then was so hard it would not crumble under my weight. Holding up the mirror is a propane tank, which alludes to masculinity always finding its way into our lives. From this image, I want you to ask yourself, who is letting me outside? And what psychologically upholds these constructs of gender? How can I address that? And that is my piece, Let Outside. Hi, my name is Fiona Jin, and I am a 2023 winner in writing. My pronouns are she, her. This piece is called Fiona Jin would quit crocheting on the first day. Whereas Jin Fuyuan would knit a full patchwork sweater, maybe gifted to a pessimistic counterpart over poem writing in porch light. Jin Fuyuan flies American. Fiona Jin is on her mother's United Airlines Platinum status and sports uncomfortable J. Crew blazers in the lounge. Jin Fuyuan tried so hard to wrap it well and sorry for the Christmas bells. My family is an American, Christian. Fiona Jin silently slits the package open with her pinky finger and says, here is a paper cut. Here is my violence. Jin Fuyuan has plump lips, always speaking, and cannot knit. Fiona Jin has plump lips, always bleeding, and likes sweater. They also have a secret triplet, Jin Fuyuan, who rarely drags herself out of her room these days, who has dark eye bags like danger until she is lured out by the candied hall every Chinese New Year. Her closed mouth laughs so crystalline she might crumple inwards and break. The other two are in awe. On the floor, the battered wrapping paper, the sweater baggy with holes, the tarnished silver needles, Fiona Jin publishes poems. The other two fight her to write them. Hi, my name is Gabriela Ray and I'm a 2023 writing winner. And my piece written on the bathroom wall, I wrote uh, the summer before my senior year, kind of as a way to cope with, um, you know, uh, leaving for college and leaving a lot of the people that I love and, and my best friends in New York. And, um, you know, I kind of wrote it as a way to tell myself hey, it's okay to lose touch with people because you will find them again. Um, my two main characters, Vicky and Jess, uh, get into a big fight and uh, they become friends again in a girl's bathroom. So, you know, anything can happen. Vicky? No response. Jess sighs loudly and stomps away to the sink. She twists the squeaky knob and runs the water. We hear the sounds of Vicky sobbing loudly. Jess turns around to face the stall. It's reflected in the mirror behind her. She realizes Vicky is crying. Jess is conflicted, too afraid to comfort her, but doesn't want to leave her alone in the bathroom. Jess, Vicky, are you okay? Are you crying? The loud sobbing stops. Vicky, no. Jess takes a leap of faith. Look, I know it's been a while since we hung out, but do you want to talk to me about it? Uh, I'm here for you. Jess looks at her smiling poster on the wall of the bathroom. If that'll make you stop sobbing very loudly and scaring away all the girls so they won't see the lovely posters in the bathroom. 
Vicky stops crying. She's conflicted too. She looks over at the sharpied in Vic plus Jess equals BFF on the bathroom stall door, fading away and smudged. Hi, I'm Gracie Ann, a 2023 writing winner. Today, I'm here to discuss a certain element of my play, The Reunion. When I first decided to share the piece with my friends, many of them asked me why I ended with the cupcakes. And it is rather strange, like my main character had just found out that her estranged son was dead, and somehow we end on the topic of half-baked cupcakes. Originally, I wanted them to serve as a mood setter. You know, uh, it's an autumn day in the Bay Area, the weather's cloudy but not gloomy, and we're in the kitchen preheating the oven and mixing the batter. Everything screams coziness. But then, an old friend comes knocking on the door with some really bad news, and the piece shatters just like that. In this sense, the cupcakes still set the mood. While grieving for a loved one, the sugary promise of desserts feels rather hollow. Hateful, even. I mean, when all you would want to do is scream, cry, go numb, do nothing, the cupcakes are still in the oven, waiting for you to take them out. That's when the loneliness strikes in, I think. That's when you realize, oh, I'm grieving, and I'm alone in this. I really wanted to capture that feeling of smallness, that feeling that no matter how strong your emotions are, in the end, it still doesn't really matter. The world keeps spinning, the cupcakes are going to be burnt eventually, and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's kind of my reasoning for including the cupcakes in the final scene of my play. Thanks for listening! Hi, my name is Olive Harrington and I'm a 2023 Photography Award winner. So my piece, Osmosis, was created alongside um, a series of work inspired by my fear of the dark and my reliance upon nightlights. Um, so specifically in Osmosis, I wanted to showcase the duality of nightlights and how you use a nightlight to kind of cast this force field of safety light around you and protect yourself from the dark and how in reality sleeping with any sort of light is super harmful for your health. And uh, within the photo, I wanted to showcase that sort of sense of self-sabotage by dressing myself up as a nightlight and then taking that self-portrait. And I didn't feel quite done with the photo, so I um, decided to showcase one of the symptoms of sleeping with lights on, which is restlessness. So I took up, I took the photo, I printed it out, and then submerged it under water and then re-photographed that with the water moving to kind of show that restless motion and um, add that to it. And I think as I move away from the series in general, I look at osmosis as kind of representing the way that, you know, what we consume and absorb on the outside um, gets reflected internally, um, whether that be like light when you sleep or just other things within your day-to-day -day life. So yeah, and I think osmosis for me was definitely a turning point in my photography because it really opened up so many different avenues for me to explore um, digital manipulations as well as more uh, physical ones. So yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Bella Rotker and I'm a 2023 writing award winner. This poem is called Exhibit. Roaches are older than dinos. You hate how people say the earth was once green and perfect and belonged to the dinosaurs. Their museum bound bones know as well as you do that living has always been this scary. Maybe not white, but red. We are far from an ice age. Even dinosaurs were afraid of roaches and maybe they also cried and slept in the yard until you could come kill them. Were the dinos sore? Sure. You always say that when I ask if it hurt when they died. Google says it was long and miserable. Will it be like that this time? Maybe not red, but white hot. What does it feel like to burn? I don't like thinking that after it singes us, time will keep going without me about how our skeletons will fossilize a hundred feet above the dinos and someone will dig up our gray bones and say, wow, 
how did they let it get this bad and say the same things we did. This is the cycle of life the excavation process, look for dinosaur bones and instead find another reason to try to fix this, realize we can't fix climate change or the way you raised me, but we can use paper straws and hope it'll keep things breathing for now. We can't stop the sea from rising, salt from coating our tongues and teeth and lungs. We will become artifacts a real 21st century mother-daughter relationship pulled out from where Florida used to be. They'll pay the 20 buck admission fee and crowd around our bones and say, God, I wonder why they lived like that. Hi, my name is Isabel Kong and I am a 2023 writing winner. This is my poem, The Syntax of Heartbreak. In February, there are only honey mangoes and novelty. My lips sink from the line of sea to stone. The boy, downy in a shirt I helped pick. I, sugar spun, sink full after unwrapping his name syllables, too. I like how the bones of his jaw move, rippling, reflecting noctilucent clouds. He spits out words slick with pear. It brings me back to Sunday dim sum. Chicken feet sleeping in bamboo beds. I used to peel the red and flesh away to reveal slender bone and talons. It was a sordid affair for my tongue, which sagged in reluctance. Star Anis, the boy understands, because we share the language of assimilation, damp vowels and consonant clusters. Today we swell quiet in the twilight of his Camry. The birthmarks on his wrist form a colon, and I wish for our sea-salted fingers to be clauses. Breathe his cotton sweat. If I'm here is an oath. His lips burst. I turn chiropter in, and feed on his blood. Talons flush. A cavity replaces my organs, wet, sucking, wanting. Our ribs grow long-bodied, bare of marrow, Kleenex crumpled beneath my bed. From what used to be a lung, grows thick spores until the tide acquaints our bodies to a singular corpse. Everything is skin. Hi, I'm Hamani Lewis, and I am the art winner for 2023. My pronouns are she and her. My work that was selected is called New Era. The work is about how in a lot of Renaissance paintings, there are normally people of non-color and normally symbolizes wealth and status and power. I wanted to show that black culture and being black had power in itself and sort of putting more reputation that I wanted to see as a kid for other people. Of course, there's now there's more black artists making art which I love that I really didn't see when I was growing up which allowed me to make a lot of work that went on with black issues. With my work it's an oil-based painting. The mark making is sort of like a cross an up and down mark making and the work was really fun to make mostly like the process of it. I had fun with the lighting getting the figures right, getting all the props right. I really had fun like painting everything. And then if you notice in the painting, this piece right here, is it? It's it's fabric with some little heart stuff on it. Um, really, my work is really about just addressing issues that I find in my community and sometimes in others. And I wanna make it very well known that I am not afraid to speak out whatever is needed. My name is Katarina Melabarba. I'm a 2023 Young Arts winner for the writing novel category. Uh, my novel, The Ex Villains Redemption Project, is a story about a bunch of um, fantasy villains who are put into a support group slash community service project and inadvertently save the world. It's a love letter to fantasy and kind of a satire. Here's a short excerpt from it. That was what Hira called us, the gang. Nero, on the other hand, called us a lost cause. Donovan called us the support group. Me? I like to think of this as the ex-villains redemption project, ironically, of course, because that was what we were. We were villains whose stories had ended, whose heroes had moved along, monsters who'd been dragged out of the closet, kicking and screaming and pushed unceremoniously out into the daylight. We'd all had our arcs, our doomed journeys, spit out and dissected by Hera so many times we could practically recite each other's word for word. 
tragic backstory, inciting incident, rise to power, fatal flaw, moment of near triumph, and moment of defeat. The last one defined us. Excellence. No point in fighting to win. We'd already lost. A new villain. That meant a new conflict, a new story, a new addition to the ranks of the vanquished and the vengeful, one that I, cloistered away in my prison of spiderwebs and stone, had entirely missed. Suddenly the additional escort made sense. They weren't really here for me. Hi, my name is Cadence Rice, and I am a 2023 spoken word young arts writing winner. And I'll be reading my piece after I overheard you and Gabriel gossiping about me. He asks if I'm spiritual. Not in the way that gods tell me to be. I don't drink wine or kneel to the cross. The last time I prayed, I was high and maybe a little sad, and I swore I wouldn't bother you again. There are nights when the only things that I can think about are glass and paper and the stars. My mind becomes a kaleidoscope of couplets, and there are only so many moments left for us and too many days to waste. The moon hangs above us, and I'll ask him about the Bible, and he will tell me about the revelations and the fire, and I will ask him again, and he will sift the ashes together to create a new earth. The seventh day we will awaken and there will be lava and torn pages, not in the way you probably want me to be. But I'll still sit here and ask why you didn't show up until now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liam Melissa. I'm a 2023 writing winner. This is a short excerpt from my piece, I Will Not Forget. The room is shrouded in darkness. The only light was coming from the lone candle flickering in the middle of the room and the sliver of moonlight escaping through the clouds. It won't take long before they fix the problem causing the blackout. Despite the poverty and loss that the darkness signifies, I can't help but find a small part of it to be beautiful. How it wraps the room in a warm blanket and deceased went into thinking that there isn't anything that can't be covered away or smothered over. The reality is that the struggles we face as a society, the struggles that women face, cannot be forgotten. At some point, the power would return, and the room would once again be veiled in light, a feast for all to see. But sometimes, all the pain, hate, poverty, Domestic violence, child marriage, and illiteracy pave the road to strength and courage. And between the moments of darkness, there are moments of light and hope. And I realize that these moments in the lives of those around me have shaped me more than any of the dark ones have. I am inspired by how these women have turned their weaknesses into their weapons. I am inspired by Tigus' courage and embrittled ambition by Zodé's forgiveness and conviction, and by Moulier's open heart and selflessness. So I will not forget. We will not forget. Hi, my name is Lily Marquardt, and I'm a 2023 Visual Arts Merit winner. My body of work is centered around themes of perfectionism, identity, and material manipulation. I am always worried when drawing or painting about truly reflecting the world around me. I encountered many slumps and roadblocks when trying to pursue this type of art. But when I started making abstract patterns, I was finally having fun again. My intent shifted from direct representation to self-expression. My 2D prints are an attempt to break free from the boundaries that I force upon myself in my art and in the rest of my life. At the start of a piece, I remove the deliberate and overthought actions and rely instead on my subconscious. I let my hands do whatever feels good in the moment. And although that means I will create sometimes things that I don't like, it also means I can create things that I really love. For me, the positive end of this risk is much more rewarding than a product deliberately derived from a still life or figure drawing. I've been able to step away from my own ideals of what makes art good and create the type of art that is pleasing to me without worrying about whether others like it. I create my own value by making only what I could. I've learned that I would rather capture my feelings than a highly specific angle of the world. My materials also reflect a challenge against perfection. In all of my work, I use found materials. 
I prefer to experiment with materials that aren't typically used because I find that I can relate better to objects chosen by me than a paintbrush or pencil. These found objects are much more apparent in my 3D work, but they are still present in my 2D pieces. My 3D work directly shows off the items that I find captivating instead of making marks on them with the surface. I find elements of the material that I appreciate and focus in on them by removing all other visual elements. My headpieces become an extension of my mind and a physical representation of the details that I notice about the world around me. Hello everyone, my name is Michaela Moody and I am the Young Arts 2023 winner in writing and here is my piece titled Crowning Moment. When they say my hair needs to be fixed, I simply tell people this story. My hair was bonnet wrapped before my naps, shower ring with Walmart caps, hair primped and primed, donut glazed with oil shine, that's how you describe my hair. This kinky-ish, this fabulousness can never be copied. Not to quote the times my hair has been misappropriated in the media, but I let that slide. No sequel of a movie is better than the original. See, my hair is a trendsetter. My hair speaks Ebonics. Sorry, not sorry if it's not proper enough for your understanding, but my hair is electrifying. Defies gravity and all of its uniqueness. This 4C is so uniquely me, but my hair has been through struggles. The struggle that black girls were taught young not to love their natural hair. Or the struggle that perming it at 12 was the only way to be considered beautiful in society. Because hair is not just hair for me. This hair gathered my ancestors through slavery. This hair was savory. As we used butter and baking grease as means to moisturize because at the time, black hair was not made of any value. It was then deemed a commodity. This hair has no law protecting it against discrimination in the state of Georgia. So we must fight. Fight like our ancestors who died in the oceans because death was better than bondage. Fight until I hear our voices scream from the rooftops of Congress. Fight until every lock, curl, braid, twist, and weave is seen as equal from our kitchen to the backyard. I don't know about y'all, but my hair shows a journey. My hair shows a journey. I don't think you got the patience for it. This hair is so kinky, you would think it was a super freak. This hair is so beautiful, you would think it was Julius. The way it stabs at the heart, it tells you what the true meaning of beauty is. This hair is so holy, only Moses could party in this hair stands for generations of the oppressed and i represent them to death with no hesitation so if you say my hair needs to be fixed i will tell you you are mistaken because you can't fix what was never broken hi my name is avina sai i'm a 2023 winner in writing and i'm going to be reading a short excerpt from the end of my spoken word poem when i was first told I was eight when I was first told to embrace who I was. I informed my parents that I no longer wanted to wear a kurta to the Diwali assembly, that I no longer wanted to eat Indian food for lunch, that I no longer wanted to embrace the culture of a country whose air I never breathed, and a country where all breath was the notes of the star-spangled banner, and the sky was painted with blue and white and red, all the colors my friends bled that I thought I didn't. My mother told me, honey, you have roots deep anchored in this earth that my parents dragged over shoulders across oceans to this land that you stand in, crying. Your grandfather wasn't the first to leave Dahod for you to hate the place that he called home. Your grandmother wasn't the first to leave her family behind for you to say they don't exist. Now, I realize I didn't only bleed blue and red, but I also bled the green of mangroves and the orange of sweet mangoes and the brown of cinnamon and the seven continent world I'm in runs through my veins, so there's nothing I should ever abstain from showing it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicole Molina and I am a 2023 visual arts winner. My pronouns are she, her. And my body of work revolves around feminism and growing up with a single mom. My mom has always done things manly around the house that a typical father or a male figure would do. But in this scenario, in this piece, both roles, I try to show how she's taking both roles of parenthood as she's being the mother and she's being the father of the family. She is what is considered the breadwinner of her family. So she cooks, cleans, she fixes the tires and fixes the sinks and she brings money home. Because of this, I'm very inspired by her and 
I try to make artwork about how our lives are intertwined and how many other single mothers out there and daughters can relate to our situation. I try to also put in a lot of Latino elements in my artwork to try to kind of create a more sense of community within these pieces and make it more personal to me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stevie Trask and I am a 2023 writing winner for creative nonfiction. The title of my piece is like an old French Revolution painting. Growing up in Paris felt safe, even though it was a big city. I was comfortable taking the bus home alone from gymnastics late at night. I would scooter past crowded cafes, over cobblestone streets, lonely dark alleys, to and from the bus stop, all in the glow of the streetlights. But on January 7th, 2015, that feeling of safety changed. After finishing our school's typical four-course lunch, my class was suddenly let out of school early. I was 10 years old. The teachers abruptly dismissed us, and we all just left the building, slightly bewildered. I opened the big green doors, unlocked my kick scooter from the rack outside, and scooted home alone. I went on my usual route alongside the Seine, almost falling and my wheel got caught in the cobblestones, longingly gazing at the nearby bakery filled with the smell of fresh pastries and baguettes, passing near the Grand Mosque and Institut du Monde Arabe, finally making it home. The teachers didn't tell us what was going on. They may have barely known themselves. We understood, though, once we heard the news that night. There had been a massive terrorist attack in Paris. It turns out the attack was in the same neighborhood as my school, and the attackers had not yet been apprehended. Two French Muslim brothers, part of the Islamic terrorist group Al-Qaeda, forced their way into the offices of the weekly French satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo. The magazine is known for publishing funny and often outrageously disrespectful raunchy articles and comics on everything from politics to daily life. The paper had recently published satirical cartoons of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. My entire elementary school was wandering the same streets at the same time as heavily armed Al-Qaeda terrorists who had just shot and killed 14 people. For days, we were bombarded with sirens, police cars, and cordoned off buildings, and also signs of solidarity saying Je suis Charlie. The attacks forced France to temporarily close embassies and schools in more than 20 countries for fear of reprisals, including my elementary school. The city united in protest with barricades popping up, looking like old, old, old oil paintings from the French Revolution. Thank you. My name is Olivia Lay, and I am a 2023 writing winner. This poem is titled Ocean Origami. And I know that with immigrants comes dismemberment, comes the mar of a diaspora's dialogue, comes deceit, drowning us in a sailor drunk with ocean, and I want to break up with my culture too. I want to tell this America how much I hate the way she looks at us. But instead, I origami, and I fold my grandmother with I fold to the wrinkles in her forehead that she deepened when her bare feet made birthmarks in the riverbed. I fold to the creases of her palms as they craft this cartography of our ancestry. I fold to the red seams of her aoyai. Each stitch that she embroidered is an emblem to her family. I fold to the square sheets of dough, cook dumplings and wontons, try to pinch the ends without the entrails emerging. I fold to the borders between home and hope, territories that have tried to make ties. I am folding origami from the shredded skin of my family, from the layers of my culture, from something flat to something whole. And I mostly fold cranes that can't fly but still float and we are still told to get over ourselves. Because people don't bridge rivers here in America. They fill them with a hell out of ocean. Hi, my name is Lily Matrani and I am a 2023 winner in photography. This photo is titled Self-Portrait One and is a part of my 10-piece series titled My Gush. Gush, rhymes with smush. Synonym, belly fat or rolls. For as long as I can remember, I always felt as if every day I woke up with a different feeling about my body and my gush. I go from hating it, to ignoring it, to working out and trying to get rid of it, to even making fun of it in front of my friends who didn't have as much gush as me. Every time I'd sit in front of a mirror, I'd examine my body, moving and squishing around my stomach. And before I learned to embrace it, I would pull all of my gush together and wish that I could just detach it from my body. 
trying to squeeze into clothes and covering up my stomach while sitting always served as a painful reminder of these insecurities. While smushing around one night, pushing, pulling, and molding at my stomach like it was a new can of Play-Doh, I realized just how beautiful the form is. And by moving in different directions, arching, pulling, pushing, and pinching, I made beautiful abstract patterns. Although intimidating and a little uncomfortable at first, I was able to produce both literal and abstract series that show my discovery of the beauty created by my own body. Specifically in this photo, the first of my series, I wanted to show how I start off every morning of mine, trying to zip up my school shorts and stuff my gush into them. I wanted to create a photo that showed how my gush affects me daily. The goal behind this series was to ultimately not find a new love for my own body, but to also show others that there is beauty in something usually perceived as an insecurity. Through this series, I was able to find the beauty in the gush. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ali McCrary. I'm a 2023 writing award winner. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm gonna be reading an excerpt from my spoken word poem, Dear God, Are You a Boy or a Burden? And I swear that there are some heavens that you can only find in summer times and first loves and a testosterone shot. There are some heavens where the gods look just like us and some don't even tape their chests. They don't have to, they're gods, but you won't even let us live and be human. I can't crawl out of this skin and trust me, I would, but even if I did, I'm sure it wouldn't make you happy because it's just not natural enough. Headline, this year on pace to see a record anti-transgender bills passed by the states in BC by March 2022. Nearly 240 anti-LGBTQ bills had already been filed in the year. I have updated this document with new headlines over the past three years. I haven't been able to remove any irrelevant headlines. Only add more. So okay then. Build your laws around the kids you love so much then. Baptize my body in your backwards beliefs then. And I promise you, I will bleed boy right out of my uterus and into that water. You may bleed blue, but I bleed boy. Hello, my name is Patience Wiley and I'm a 2023 Young Arts Honorable Mention winner for writing. And this is my poem entitled, Against Me. I often hide behind metaphors often use rose petals and broken glass as a makeshift shield ripped pages and broken pens a sword me on a battlefield where i do not know what the war is this voice all sweet tea in summer air is the only way i know how to make sense of the world around me make sense of myself or maybe just convince myself of that which i don't understand like my confidence is a spinning glass door, my beauty penciled on, my mistakes erasure marks so clear, my personality glowing hammers. My joy is a poorly made mask covering poorly concealed exhaustion. I am tired. I am tired of corner store compliments. You do not have the resources to provide, nor I the resources to afford. I am tired of pumpkin carriage friends who pull the ground from under me every time the clock strikes 12. I am tired of having to wrap the world in this language just for it to speak to me. I am tired and that is not a metaphor and life is not a metaphor and I am not a metaphor. Do you know what it's like to walk into a room full of people and only feel alone? to walk into a room you thought was your home full of people and feel nothing but less than and if you do can you explain it to me in a way in which i will understand and if you can't and i still hand you my armor do you know how not to use it against me thank you Hi, my name is Sophia Zing. I'm a 2023 Young Arts winner for writing. Today I'll be reading an excerpt from my piece, Ungrieved. Scanning through our bookshelf on a Wednesday afternoon, a title catches my eye. I curl up in the dusty nook between the piano and cabinet and flip through a parent's guide to raising grieving children. Children process grief in different ways, it says. There are stages to grief, it says. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Yet the presence of grief is always assumed. It's been months since the funeral, but I have yet to miss my father. 
Should I be over at least the denial stage by now? You don't know I law at seven, but you know that you should be sad when your father dies. Months before my father passes, Dong Sheng, his college best friend, visits and brings a gift. Huang Fei Hong spicy peanuts. While crouching to look me in the eye, he tells me to value the time I have left with my brave, strong fighter of a father. I clench a probably properly of the snack bag and listen to it crinkle. Before and since, I've heard people talk about the heroism of cancer patients. But disease isn't an ugly beast, liver cancer especially. Urine red from blood. Yellow everything, skin, nails, eyes. A feeble voice that calls out for help to go to the bathroom. A clenched fist voice that yells about the taste of a perfectly fine lunch, quick to anger from the inescapable pain. A broken voice that asks to see my face, to be with me. A father who loves me. I want to remember my father at his best, as the person I'm always told he was, as a person who oozed love, kindness, and life. But my father went abroad to Beijing right after I was born and was hospitalized with stage four liver cancer when I was three. I know that father only as a secondhand story, through details passed down in an extended game of telephone. I know my father only as something diseased and dying even in life and as a blurred sketch in death. Hi. My name is Enrique Oropesa, and I'm a merit winner in Young Arts 2023 Design Arts Discipline. I'm so excited to be able to share my work with you today and tell you more about the inspiration behind it. My piece is titled By Her Generous Nature, Preliminary Looks, and it's part of a larger collection of work that explores my personal love of nature, as well as my emotional desire to escape to and reconnect with it. The inspiration for this collection comes from a series of paintings I've been working on this year that unpack my past relationships as well as my connection with the Florida Everglades and Biscayne Bay. For this specific piece, I wanted to create a series of garments that felt organic and connected to the earth, but also modern and sophisticated. I used a combination of traditional and digital techniques to create these designs, starting by sketching out my ideas on paper and then scanning them onto my iPad. From there, I used digital software to refine and add color to the designs, playing around with different shapes and details to make sure each garment felt unique, but also unified in color and style. I utilized patchwork and color blocking to create interesting patterns and balance, creating a range of garments that could be associated with growth, serenity, and renewal. The process of designing these garments was challenging, as I wanted to create a skirt and dress that could be worn by a more masculine presenting consumer, and I'm really proud of the final result. As an artist, my pieces are heavily rooted in my personal experiences and emotions, and with that in mind, I consider my designs to be beautiful and emotional representations of my larger body of work. I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to share my passion for exploring the complexities of the self and how we can utilize design to investigate the connection between nature and emotion. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the anthology. Hi, I'm Sydney Blue Garcia Yao, and I'm a winner in writing for 2022 and 2023. Here's my piece, Words. Seven. It's time for dinner, and my grandmother slips a slim soy jazz skin from the plastic, the silky wee powder like snow against her tan palms. Her hands are the texture of leather and the hardiness of rug rope. I pick at the bits of fallen flour until my grandmother says something in Hakanese I can't understand. I assume she wants me to get up and attend to my mother, tired from a long day of work. I've gotten better at predicting what she says without words. I greet my mother and she replies in English, as always. She slips her heels off with a sigh before showering, hot steam evaporating the traces of work from her. I'm bored, the long days of summer simmer slowly. I'm tired of reading books, my only solace of English in this house of unknown dialects. In my head, when my mother speaks Hawkins with her parents, I imagine random characters or subtitles, like in foreign films. The sounds move like a chain of words and alien marks on paper. Back in the kitchen, I lean my chin against the edge of the counter and watch my grandmother intently as she crimps the edges of the dumplings. She looks at me as if she's something to say, but then looks back to the half-warm dumplings. Once, I insisted that I, too, wanted to fold the edges. When my grandmother cooked them, the filling spilled out, and I ate plain dumpling skins. I contemplate asking my grandmother about her cooking, in hopes that after she leaves, my delicious food will remain. I don't have the words to ask.
and said, I accept that she'll return to China in a few days and anticipate the return of English in our house. I detach myself from the counter to look for my mother. I find that she is still in the shower. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ro Bloom Wong and I'm a 2023 writing winner. I'm going to be reading my poem titled Zhang Su 1944. And when I open my eyes, we are leaving, fleeing east to greet the bleeding dusk, gone as its tendrils crawl forth. You are lucky and we move in blankets of bees. How can one mass hold a million jolts? Two million breaths, but not my mother's and not the sister's whose name I wear and still we ripple into the outskirts. Bodies. I guess that's what we became when they forced pork down my mother's closed throat. Your brothers and sisters weren't lucky like you, and we are leaving again. So I try to close my eyes, but end up pressing the wind into lotus petals. I seal boxes of books that can never be read because you need to hurry. And I wonder how that soldier aimed so slick his bullet danced through my uncle's one cheek and clean out the other, and somehow I know we are not going back. I untwist the waves from my hair, miss the days I won't remember, wish my aunt would take me back, but no, no paper can buy back a revolution. This time when the harvest moon rises, I know we really are leaving. I have a ticket past the shore as if the bodies aren't dangling underside the train and off the rails, and there, now, we are leaving, fast skimming towards sea, away from a sun so red, I close my eyes. Hi, I'm Sophia Lucas, and I won in 2023 for writing slash short story with my short story, Zwana 89. When Yunus came to visit in the summer of 89, the summer of the World Wide Web and 24 satellites, Summer when Mina Olin Moistenut by Kim Non Hom was number one for 12 weeks straight and seemed to be playing on every other radio station in the good company of Madonna and Baton Rouge. He had no idea his world was about to change. He came in mid-June when the days stretched so tall that they almost pushed out the nights altogether. That's how it was with Summer in Helsinki, as if the universe thought a few short weeks of endless sunlight could make up for the bottomless darkness of the winters. My dad told me he came on a truck. That sounded normal enough to me. But then he talked about how Jonas's mother, my dad's sister, had paid the, the truck driver to smuggle him in the back with the barrels of petroleum oil. But she explained why when he came in, he smelled like he'd been locked in an auto repair shop all night, and why one of the first things he said was that his nose was stinging. Though I didn't know he said this, of course, until my dad translated afterwards. Jonas said it first in Estonian, then realized I couldn't understand and repeated it in Russian, but even with my few years of the language at school, I couldn't recognize the word stinging. Now it's one I never forget. Tere anti was the next thing he said. Uh, Privet, uh, hey, he said, finally coming to the finished word in the end. Somehow, I was surprised he knew my name. I'd never met UNS before. Ordinary Soviet citizens had almost no hope of getting the required government approval to travel out of the country. And though my dad sometimes made trips there, my mother was nervous and wouldn't let him take me. And at first, I spent a lot of time just watching him. He had blonde, curly hair, almost golden, so much so that for a brief moment, I thought to myself that Kulta Kultri, Goldilocks, would be the perfect nickname for him. I used to have hair that color, but by the time I was 15, the age I was when Jonas first came, it had darkened slightly, leaving it the color of wet sand with occasional bright streaks in the summer that wouldn't last long. Jonas had brown eyes, mine were blue. Sometimes I stared in the mirror and tried to see if we looked alike. I didn't see many similarities, but what I did notice was that he looked a lot like my dad when he was a kid. So we really are related, I thought. Hello. I am Zora Nux and I am 2022 Young Arts Honorable Mention winner for photography. I submitted a series of diptychs of different sets of twins in my family titled To the Moon. My goal for this project was to show the lineage of female twins in my family and to depict the unique bonds that each of them share. My grandmother's image is the one chosen for this event and the first of the series because she was the inspiration behind the whole thing. Initially, I planned to shoot a series about her solely based on the fact that she has always been a role model for me growing up. I've always admired her strength and courage, but in 2021, after I witnessed my grandmother losing her twin, it made my love and admiration for her grow so much deeper. Watching her experience such intense pain was an eye-opening experience for me. I can only imagine how she felt. 
This series encouraged me to think deeper about the connection between twin sisters and how one would eventually have to live without the other. Now I'd like to read a paragraph from the artist statement that I wrote for this series. This series explores the pain and the joy of the twin connection and what it feels like when it is lost. Being a twin is to know someone before you can even fathom your own existence. It is sharing a love that is infinite and will outlive time itself. It is the deepest bond between two beings that often changes but never dies. My twin is the other piece of the puzzle that is my existence. I see myself in her just as she sees herself in me. This duality inspires my art. Symmetry has been at the center of my consciousness since the beginning of my artistic career. I chose to illustrate these emotions with photography because it helps me express the feelings that can't be described. When I witnessed firsthand what it looks like to lose that puzzle piece, I wondered, how can you prepare for the death of half of your soul? How can one go on without the other? It is inevitable, but impossible to prepare for. Being a twin is to know someone's heart from the moment yours began beating until the moment theirs stops. Thank you. My name is Thada Prakash and I'm a 2023 writing winner. The piece I'm reading from is called My Father's Eyes and it's a creative nonfiction essay. My father is my hero. He visits my grandparents regularly to take care of them. He always arrives home from work every evening with a huge smile on his face. And he never cries during sad movies, not even when we watched Where the Red Fern Grows. In my eyes, there were no chinks in his armor. But every family is its own universe, and every universe is aligned one way, until an event throws off the entire orbit. I remember that night so vividly. That night where I found the cracks in my father's armor. Thunder growled, and the tendrils of clouds stole the sky from the stars and the moon. The storm devoured every pinprick of light. In movies, circumstances are often characterized and amplified by the weather. A murder or robbery may take place on a stormy night, whereas a joyful reunion would occur in sunny weather. The night my father cried was just like that. Inside our warm house, we were oblivious to the rain. My brother and I were playing basketball with a tiny hoop on the top bunk of my bed. I tossed him the ball, and he swished it in. My mom came in, coaxing us to bed. Several moments later, we heard the front door slam shut. My brother and I eagerly raced out to the foyer. Papa was home. But before he could race down the staircase to leap into his open arms, he met us at the top of the landing. He silently walked to my room, us clutching his legs playfully. He pushed my bedroom door open, and my brother and I jumped eagerly onto my comforter, awaiting a bedtime story. Instead, he walked briskly past to my mom. He nodded to her, a subtle dip of his head. My mom gasped and threw her arms around him. He fell into her embrace and began to cry, tears streaming down his face. My brother and I looked at each other. What was happening?